Zechariah chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Zechariah chapter 4, verse in the first verse, the Bible says, And the angel talked with me, excuse me, and the angel that talked with me came again, and walked with me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by, not, by, not by might, nor by power, but by spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Let's move. I mean, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. We thank you for your blessings upon the church here at Dover. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to bless us in a hard day. We pray these things in the sweet, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on the mountain mover. Now, uh, we live in a very, very difficult day, and sometimes we let that overwhelm us when we should not. Do we not serve the great God of this Bible? Do we not serve the God that, that split the Red Sea? Do we not serve the God that rained manna for 40 years on the nation of Israel and nourished them when there was nothing to be nourished with? That's the very God we serve. And listen, we don't have those kinds of problems yet. But you know what? Uh, we moan and groan over the problems that we do have. Uh, our, churches get, our churches are getting smaller. Well, so what? The first church had 12 members, right? Amen. So why are we stressed? Why are we upset? Well, uh, uh, the church is falling away. Well, praise God. The Bible says that has to happen for the end to come. So good. Let it fall away. Amen. Uh, why do we get upset? And the reason we get upset is we begin seeing God as the world sees God. Yeah. You, why, you know why there's no, not very many sovereign grace churches? I'll tell you why. Most people don't think he's sovereign to start with. Yeah. You know, it never ceases to amaze me that, that all, the, all the instances in the Bible where even Jesus in the flesh displayed his sovereignty, peace be still, and immediately the wind and the wave was gone, and still we doubt it. How could that be possible? Well, I can tell you the possibility is it's our flesh. Mm -hmm. Our flesh gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody thinks about the problems with the flesh as some kind of sensual thing, and that's true. But the biggest problem is your, in your flesh is doubting God. Mm -hmm. that, that's your biggest problem. And, and, and so we see uh, in the days of Zechariah, it was the very same thing. Now, uh, Haggai and Zechariah were contemporaries. They, they lived at the same time. They, they shared a ministry. And Haggai speaks of Zechariah in his own writings and in fact records his calling unto the Lord God Almighty uh, in Haggai. So they lived and worked together uh, to further the cause of Christ. Now, Haggai, Zechariah, and Zechariah, and this is about the time next, but there's about there's about two, and then and then it's over with for four hundred years. 
Could you imagine not hearing from God? If you're saved, you know what a, a sad feeling it would be to think of not hearing from God in the person of the Holy Ghost for 400 years. Think about that. 400 years ago, it was 1623. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and not hearing from our Lord and Savior for that long. Well, they were about to experience that, and Haggai and Zechariah were warning, saying, hey, this is coming, this is going to be your lot. And again, they would not answer. So in uh, chapter 4, uh, Zechariah begins to have this dialogue, uh, this, uh, this time with an angel. Now remember, at their time in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost made no appearing. In fact, I believe he was in heaven. I, I believe that was his abode then because the, we see him a few times. Uh, we see him uh, when the Spirit moved upon the face of the water, separated, separating the land and the sea and, and the creation of God, and you don't see him a whole lot more after that until the New Testament. That he, Behold, I said the accomplished. And, and then he took on his ministry for the church age. And, and he has done very well with that ever since. And so very, with, with, in lieu of that, we find very frequently in this day, uh, the Lord Almighty sent his messages through angels. Who told Zechariah that uh, he would have a son? An angel, right? And, and so that was, that was the movement here in this time as well. And the angel talked with me, and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Now, I want you to see that the, the message of verse 1 is very important. The angel came to Zechariah and said, wake up. Church, you need to wake up. I need to wake up, you need to wake up, and you need to wake up. We're living in a very strange day, but God is on the throne. You know what lets me uh, fluff up my pillow and go to sleep at night and not worry about the chaos? Because I know God is on the throne. Nothing passes him by. And, and, and so we see that the first call is simply wake up. And the angel of the Lord talked with me, uh, and the angel of the Lord that talked with me came again and waked me as a man is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? Now, I ask you that. What do you see? What seest thou? Look out. You know, this morning, uh, praise God, we had some rain. Yeah. Now, when I was thinking about those 120 chairs getting wet, that was my first thought, right? Man, it's raining on those chairs. But then I thought, you know why it's raining? Because God made it rain. We must have needed this in somehow. Right. And, and so, praise God for the rain. And I laid there in my bed, and I was reading my Bible on my phone and enjoying the rain. Truly, I was. And then, you know, if I have to wipe some chairs down, so be it. You know, you know what? The Lord God knew before eternity passed I'd be wiping chairs down, so why should I fight it? Right? And, and, and so we, uh, we often look at things in a negative, sad way when we should be rejoicing in it. And, and, and said unto me, what do you see? What do you see, Zechariah? And I said, uh, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. Now, he sees this thing which we would uh, probably refer to as a candlestick or a chandelier, and it had, a, it, it had a base, and it came up and kind of did like this, and on the round part, it had places for seven candlesticks, and that's what he, uh, he perceived it. Now, we're going to see there's a little bit more explanation in that, but there's two things now. Wake up, Zachariah, 
and take a look. And when he says, what are you seeing, Zechariah? You know what? Uh, you know what that makes Zechariah? It makes him responsible. You know, we live in a day and age where kids just don't want to be responsible, do they? Right. They don't want to be responsible for anything. If, uh, if my daughter, Bella, gets bad grades, it's not her teacher's fault, it's her fault. And that's what she's taught, right? Now, Sister Hannah is in the public school system, and if her students get bad grades, it's Hannah's fault, right? And that, 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 that's the flip side. You wonder, you, you wonder why, huh, why kids think that way? They're taught to think that way in the modern day, right? And, and we see that as soon as he sees this vision, that it immediately he becomes responsible of the vision. You know what? When you learn and know that you are a sinner depraved from the very beginning of your life, now you're responsible for it. It belongs to you. Uh, there has to be some answer for that. And, and so we see that Zechariah said, this is what I'm seeing. Verse 4, So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Now, and as he perceives this vision, he, he knew there was more to it. And he says, what, what, what is the meaning of this? What, what, what is the content of what you're trying to show me? Then, then the, verse 5, Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? Again, responsibility. And I said, no, my Lord. You know, uh, have you ever wondered if and Armenian people are the worst for this, just begging people, and why don't you trust him? Why don't you trust him? Well, that verse has the content. Do you see it? No, my Lord. They truly don't see it. They don't see Christ as the answer to sin, and you know why? They don't even know what sin is. <clears throat> you say, well, sure they do. They've been whipped all their lives. Listen, all that tells them, that all that teaches them is to behave. It does not teach them what sin is. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see that that is the situation that Zechariah uh, found himself. And so he said, yeah, I, I don't know what, you're, what, what it is. I don't know what you're saying. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And, and so he gives him a very clear description, because listen, Zerubbabel lived in a bad day. He, he was grossly outnumbered. Mo most of the people were God-haters by nature. Uh, they, they, they did not uh, listen to anything that, Zeru uh, that Zechariah had to say, and uh, they were proud of it. And he says, this is going to come to pass, but not by you, but by the Spirit. You know, have you ever, uh, ever had new preachers kind of caught up on themselves? I've known one well. Watch men like that. Watch men like that. Now, secondly, with that said, I want you to see that in this case, Zechariah was humble. And, he, and, and the Almighty, through the angel, said, it's not going to be by your power, but by the Spirit. You want some encouragement this morning? You know, I find people, when I go from place to place to place, what they're needing is encouragement. You, you know where I can tell you to get that encouragement? And, and Zechariah says it here, by the Spirit. We are all talking about what a busy, busy, crazy world we live in the day that we live. You know why? Because it takes some thought and it takes some stillness to hear from the Holy Ghost. And certainly, the enemy doesn't want you to hear from him. You see what I'm saying? Because if, he, if you do, you're going to be encouraged, and you know whatever. Uh, he, he can't take your soul. 
soul, he knows that, so what he'll rip from you is your peace. Verse 7, who art thou, O great mountain? Now this is the angel literally talking to a mountain. Uh, one incredible mountain, and I, I've never been in them, but I flew over them to see Matthew many times as the great western Rocky Mountains. And, and they go on for miles and miles, and, and, and they're so high. And they make, uh, they look, make uh, East Tennessee look like farmland. And, uh, and, and it is just unbelievable. And can you imagine the, ma the great God of heaven looking at the entire spray of the Rocky Mountains from Idaho almost to Mexico and saying, you're nothing. <laughs> I'm going to flatten you out. You're going to be like a plane. You're not. That's the God we serve, church. That turns mountains into flat land and flat land into mountains. That makes trouble a pleasure. That makes a fight into peace. That's the God we serve. What could be better? What could be better? And, and, and why do we have these uh, times of discouragement? Well, because we're listening to the world and not listening to this. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Now, let me say this. This was not a literal mountain. It was an opposing army. It was a huge army. Zechariah was the prophet. Zerubbabel was the military leader. And he says, and, and you, can you imagine uh, facing the, you know, I think a lot of people uh, immediately say, who is the most powerful army on earth? And we want to say the United States, right? And you know why you want to say that? Because it makes you feel comfortable. But you, and, and then you say, well, then maybe it's Russia. It's not Russia either. You know who is the greatest military power in the earth? It's China. And that ought to, that ought to make, you, make your heart skip a bit because you know what? We don't like China, and they sure don't like us. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's the kind of opposition it was. The, uh, uh, think about the little British Isles, and, and they get so much glamorous. But listen, have you ever seen them on a the map? They're nothing. Look up there. They are literally nothing going in against China. That's what Zerubbabel was facing. And, and the prophet, or the angel says, listen, uh, listen Zerubbabel, don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to flatten that mountain. I'm going to take care of the opposition. I'm going to bring the opposition down. You're going to be running over on flat land. That's the God of the Bible. What, what could we say more, more than that? Now, uh, and understand in the modern day, uh, uh, and we got a few from over there in Missouri, the show me state, right? Well, I'm going to show you. And uh, you're going to, and we're all going to see that, that, that God is exactly who he says he is. Go with me to 2 Kings. Uh, uh, 2 Kings in the uh, fifth chapter. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 10. 2 Samuel, I mean, excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 10, and to, check, to set the stage, a ruler of that time had came to Naaman, who was a prophet, and said, Naaman, I have leprosy, and I need some help. Now, what in the Bible is leprosy a type of, an example of? Sin. And what did leprosy do? Leprosy consumed you. But you know what? What, what is an interesting thing about leprosy? And this is clinically true. Le leprosy doesn't hurt. You literally can have your legs rotted off to here and walk on the stumps. And you know why? Because it doesn't hurt. Now, for a time, sin doesn't hurt. In fact, sin feels good, right? It's fun to do those things. 
But see, what you don't know is it's consuming you every day. It's taking who you are. It's taking what you are. It's taking what you have bit by bit. That's a, a type of leprosy. So this self-righteous uh, Naaman comes to him and says, Listen, uh, I've got some leprosy going on, and I want you to help me. Now, Naaman, like any modern day, wants a big explosive uh, religion where they have strobe lights and people screaming and flopping on the floor and carrying on. And what does Naaman do? He gives him a simplistic answer. See, we, uh, mankind in 2023, they don't like simplistic, do they? They like complicated. They, they like things that uh, really exonerate the flesh. And so we see uh, in verse 10, with that behind us, his condition is given. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, say, saying, Go wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was wroth. You know, when we look at people and, and we say, uh, and they say, how do you be saved? How do you know God? They, they don't even say saved anymore. We're past that. How do I know God? Well, you have to be saved. Well, how do you get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yeah. Man, they want something more complicated than that, don't they? Yeah. Well, what about baptism? What about joining the church? No, no. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you know what? Nine, ten, nine times out of ten, it makes them mad. That's too simplistic. I don't believe that. Talk to Camelot and you'll find out. And, 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 and so we see that the answer that Elijah gets gives is very, very simplistic. Go down to Jordan and uh, just wash yourself there. But Naaman was wroth and went away. And behold, uh, behold, I thought he surely would come to me. <laughs> you know, uh, Naaman thought a whole lot of himself, didn't he? <laughs> well, Elijah didn't even come for a visit. Dumb pastor, he didn't come to see me, and I've had the flu. Right? Hmm. That's that, that. That's not a new thought set, is it? <laughs> it's been around, uh, I guess, from the beginning of time. So Naaman was mad. Naaman was offended by what this simplistic solution that the prophet had come up with. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. In other words, he thought he thought that, that Elijah was going to come down and, you know, uh, this Benny Hinn stuff and where you hit him on the forehead and they fall back and they get that that's what Naaman wanted something exciting, didn't he? But what does the Bible say concerning the Holy Ghost that apparently this new age movement ignores? It's a still small voice. Now what's the problem with a still small voice? If you call it a problem, it's hard to hear. Yeah. Now Jared's made strides, but Jared used to have a very quiet voice. And Jared had a lot to say. I'm serious. He, he, he's a deep thinker. But you had to listen. Right. Yeah. And, and for a man that's hard of hearing like myself, I often found myself turning my ear to Jared instead of looking at Jared. But what I found is when I listened, it was good stuff. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's how we, that is definitely how the Holy Ghost is. And these new age rollers that, that carry on, the uh, only thing I can come to is they don't know the Holy Ghost that I know. You see what I'm saying? That, that it's not the same entity. So we find that Naaman is really ticked off by this point. Verse 12. Are not <laughs> Abina and far, far rivers of Damascus uh, better than the waters of Israel? I not, and may I not wash in them to be clean? 
So he turned and went away in rage. Now, he mentions two other rivers, which is two other methods, which is works and liking self. He says, they're better rivers. They're bigger. They're stronger. They're clearer. What can I do in them? Why, why can't I jump in there? Very, very upset. Now, uh, we love the rivers here in Tennessee, but you know what? About the nastiest body of water I know of is the Cumberland River. It, it continually looks muddy, does it not? And you know why it looks muddy? It's cursed. They took some of the best farmland in Stewart County and made a river out of it. And, and, and then when you go west, the Kentucky Lake is prettier, but if you ever draw a cup of water out of Kentucky Lake, it's just as muddy and disgusting as the Cumberland River. I wouldn't drink it if it wasn't boiled if you tried to make me. Now out west where Matthew and Dessa now live, the sweetest, coldest, clearest water you've ever seen flowing from one of their rivers. Which one are you going to drink? Which one do you want to bathe in? Because remember, he had to go into it seven times. Now, I think every one of us would be ready to go for a trip to Idaho, right? The solution, they, 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 he considered it simplistic and dirty. You know what I found in the modern day? People do not like to hear much about the blood of Christ. And I've taught this church many times how 39, 39 stripes save one often resulted in the lungs falling out of the back of the body. It was a severe beating. Most people didn't survive it. And, and I'm assured and understand because the Lord Jesus had to pour out all his blood that the Almighty sustained him until, as he said on the cross, it's finished. Right? And in the very same way, you know, you know why people don't like to hear that in the day we live? Because it's gory and bloody, and a lot of people find it disgusting. See, that's Naaman's view of the River Jordan. That was Naaman's view uh, of what, what this prophet Elijah was asking him to do. Verse 13, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, thou would have done it. How much rather than when he saith unto thee, saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then went he down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a child, and he was clean. See, that, 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 that's, that's, the in, that, that's the individual that's moving mountains. Back then, leprosy was a death sentence. Now, you might live a long time with it, but it was disgusting. It was smelly. Anybody ever smelled rotted flesh, rotted human flesh besides me? It is a scent you will never forget. And I'm not making this up. Dead dog smells better than a human. And that was a leopard. You know what leopard needed? They needed their mountain move because they sure couldn't do it themselves. And God did it. What's your mountain? What, what, what's before you today that you cannot see the glory of God? Often I ask you, what, what is the mountain that keeps you advanced, from advancing in Christ? My, that is not my question this morning. What is the mountain in front of you that keeps you from seeing God? Because many of us experience that on a daily basis. You call. Now, my Georgia daughter-in-law, always a faithful member, uh, Dade County, Georgia. Show you the problem with mountains and why God needs to move them sometime. 
Dade County is in the very northwest corner of Georgia. Until 1935, you had to come into Tennessee to get into Dade County, Georgia, because there was no road to get there. And then during the Depression area, they built a road because we had all that money to build roads that I don't know where it came from, right? Uh, and uh, in that situation, they seceded from Georgia during the war between the states and said that they were their own state because nobody could reach them anyway. And, and uh, that's how isolated many people feel like Dade County, Georgia. They weren't, they weren't residents of Tennessee, but they had to use Tennessee to get there. They were supposedly residents of Georgia, but the mountains surrounded them entirely, and they couldn't even really see Georgia from where they were at. That's where, that, that's where the devil likes to keep God's people. That, 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 that's his pure delight. Besides seeing a soul going to the everlasting hell, his pure delight is, is isolating God's people, and he's a master at it because we, don't, we forget that we serve a mountain mover. You know what? Wouldn't it be a miraculous thing and we'd all be just unbelievably crazy happy if Dade County, Georgia became flat land? That's our God, is it not? Certainly it is. If, if, if they were growing cotton in Dade County, Georgia. See, we have a God like that. And, and, but I think the problem is many times we don't even see what our mountains are. No. And certainly we don't see what they're obscuring. <laughs> You know when you're going to see God at his best? <laughs> when your mountains are gone. When, you don't, when they're not there anymore. That's when you will see them the best. Last place, the Gospel of Matthew. I'll show you your mountain. <laughs> Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. Very familiar verses of Scripture. Matthew 4, and we're going to be getting, reading in the first verse. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, the mountain placer, not the mountain mover, but the mountain placer is the devil. Now, we live in some steep hills of Tennessee, but we don't live in mountains. And uh, y'all know where our house is. Do you know that there's a huge metal building, literally, what, 500 feet behind our house, maybe, maybe 1,000 feet? It's almost two stories tall. Why don't any of you know about it? Because you can't see it, right? But I promise you it's down there. We, we've often wondered what's going on down there, and we don't know that, but we do know the building is down there, right? If our land became flat, and I'm really good with that, uh, you'd see that big metal building behind our house, right? Why, what, what is your obstructor? And I can tell you most assuredly it's the devil. And, and, and so we see that Jesus, very much knowing the situation that was going to happen, very much understanding the temptation that would arrive, went up onto the mountain. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now I want you to see... First of all, the devil knew who Christ was. Don't think that he was trying to question the deity of Christ. He was not. He was trying to get Christ to obey him. Because see, if he would have, his deity is gone. Right. So that was, his, that, that was his goal. Remember on the, on the cross, 
It wasn't. It, it, what was all the invitations at the cross by, by the devil's men? Come down from the cross. They didn't want a sufficient sacrifice to happen, right? But, and so he, it wasn't that he didn't know Christ. He wanted Christ to worship him. If you don't believe that, what was the, what was the last invitation? Got up on the mountain and said, look at all these cities. In fact, it says in a moment of time, he saw, he saw all the cities of the earth. And I believe that means in time, too. And he says, all of this I will give you if thou would bow down and worship me. Now, there's two things in that. First of all, what has to be if devil, the devil made that offer? They had to be his, right? What does the Bible say in Thessalonians concerning the devil or Satan? The princes of the earth and the air. Is that right? In other words, th this, is, this realm is his. Don't ever think we're going to improve enough to be pleasing to Christ because it's not going to happen. Th this earth, when it was cursed in Genesis, listen, it was over. And, and so we find now that the devil made him a true offer, if you will. But we know in the goodness and wisdom of Christ, he didn't do that. He, he, he was faithful to the Father. He was, he was faithful. And what was his answer? Get the hints. Thou art a fence unto me. And he left. Well, actually, the Bible says he left him for a while. A season. <laughs> he came back, but he did leave him for a season. And, 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 and so we find then he moved the mountain. How, how did Christ remove the mountain on that day? He quoted him scripture with every suggestion, every offer that the devil made, Jesus quoted him scripture back. And tell me the Christ, make these stones to be made bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. Right? Answered him with scripture. So I ask you this morning, and if we would all be honest, and I think honesty is a precious, it is a precious commodity in the day in which we live. If we'd all be honest, there are mountains around us. Yeah. Now, those of us who like to go over to East Tennessee. My daughter-in-law loves it. Her family really loves it. And, uh, you know, it's pretty up there. It really is. But this is the problem. You have to get up there. Now, not only this body, I climbed one mountain in Matthew and Andrew. One minute they said they were impressed at how well I was doing, and the other time they were laughing at me. So I, I don't know which was which was the true thing. But when I go, go, go to the East Tennessee mountains, I'm driving. A lot easier than walking. But it puts my, it puts my car, my truck, my van, whatever we're in, in a bind. And the steeper the mountain, the more it groans, all right? So what's easier? Climbing a mountain? Or having it moved. What's in front of you? If you sincerely want to serve the Lord, what's in front of you? Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's jobs. Sometimes it's situations. But there are mountains before us. That's God to move. I, I, I'll tell you this, and I, I may not be... Uh, nominated for pastors of the year, but I'll tell you this, you're not able to move them on your own. But I know one that can. Ask him to move them. Whatever is in front of your service, whatever is in front. Listen, don't you want to see God in his fullness? What did Isaiah say in Isaiah chapter 6? Six, six, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. How did he do that? 
His mountain was moved. Read the first five, five chapters. Listen, he sounded like somebody on his last leg. Right? And then he, then he saw God for who he was. That's what we need to do. 